Welcome. My name is Natalie Kent, and I'm a sophomore here studying English and French. I'm here this evening to introduce our new speaker, Dr. Mark Blitz. Mark Blitz is the Fletcher Jones Professor of Political Philosophy at Claremont McKenna College. He earned his AB and PhD from Harvard University. Prior to his appointment at Claremont McKenna, he taught political philosophy at Harvard University and the University of Pennsylvania. He served during the Reagan administration as Associate Director of the United States Information Agency, where he was the senior United States official in charge of educational and cultural programs abroad. Dr. Blitz has also served as a senior staff member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and as Vice President of the Hudson Institute. He's the author of numerous books titled Conserving Liberty, Plato's Political Philosophy, Duty Bound, Responsibility in American Public Life, and Hegeter's Being and Time and the Possibility of Political Philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mark Blitz. Thanks, Natalie, for that nice introduction. Um, I once worked in government for someone very controversial, and whenever he gave a speech and received a nice introduction, he would look around and say, I must be in the wrong room. Uh, but uh, I'm in the right room. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on Confucius, although I've taught his Analects. Um, but it's not completely unreasonable that I'm talking to you about him. Uh, my area academically is political philosophy, specifically uh, Plato and Aristotle, uh, but also 19th and 20th century German philosophy. And it turns out that Aristotle and Plato are very good jumping off points for us in order to understand uh, and consider Confucius. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, I was also at one point, this was during Ronald Reagan's second term, um, in charge of our country's academic and young leader exchange programs, the Fulbright program and other programs similar to that, and also of our books and libraries and foreign cultural centers, uh, kind of the US equivalent of what China now has uh, with its uh, abroad, with all of its Confucius centers, these centers which they've started in various universities um, to some degree for propagandistic purposes, to some degree to keep tabs on students, but in general, uh, we didn't do any such things. Um, <laughs> the point of our US programs was what was then called mutual understanding. Um, now they call it soft power. We actually thought of it uh, during the Reagan administration as the war of ideas, the war of ideas. Freedom, capitalism, liberal democracy on one side, communism on the other side. So I was, as it were, an officer in this war. Um, and therefore have considered something about the effect of thought on a people uh, as a whole. Something relevant, obviously, to Confucius and China. Obviously, in a way, the war of ideas never ends, as we see today. Even if one prevails for a while, as we did, but it's a continuing and ongoing effort. So Confucius, or more literally Master Kong, it's a wonderful name, uh, lived, they think, because these things are always a bit hazy, off a year or two, lived, let's say, from, from 551 to 479 BC. His family was nobility, but he was himself not wealthy. Uh, and he always referred favorably uh, to the Zhou dynasty, which ruled his home state, which was in northern China. 
This rule was breaking down during his life. He had various minor political positions, never really a major one, although it seems that he and his students wanted major positions. That was one of his goals, not achieved. And for long periods of time, he was just an itinerant teacher. The facts of his life are hazy because reports of them are not really contemporaneous. They occur much later. Uh, most important for us, the status of the Analects, which is the central compilation of his views, the status of the Analects as a text, as we scholars say, is very unclear. The present text was compiled by a much later scholar, scholar which sayings were written or said by him or were compiled from things he actually said, who knows for sure. <laughs> so it would be very hard to study the Analects with the kind of precision with which one would study uh, a novel or even one of the works of Plato where you can be certain that the author wrote the thing and you can study the work as if reflects the intention of the author. Unclear when you study Confucius that you can do something like that. So scholars try to resolve these uncertainties by considering what was handed down after his death and then dismissing what seems historically anachronistic. The Analects are composed of 20 books a bunch of what are called chapters in each book, but the chapters are just these short sayings by and large. Books three through nine and 11 through 15 of the 20 are, are generally considered to be authentic and books four through eight are thought to be the oldest. But these I think are thoughts and no one knows certainly. So this uncertainty, as I said, really affects the precision with which anyone can study him. Now, Confucius is significant first because his thought or his statements and those of his disciples have become so important in China and in the countries influenced by it. And second, of course, he's significant because of the content of the thought itself. His work went through various stages of influence. It became significant, especially uh, during the dynasty which began to rule China in 960. This was when the civil service examinations that were based on Confucius really took hold. This importance of Confucius and commentaries on Confucius for the civil service examinations, which helped you rise to the top, this went on until 1905. So Confucius's great influence comes first from the fact that in order to make your career and keep your way, you had to know him <laughs> for the exams. Um, and second, because much of that seeped down, much of what he said then seeped down to ordinary views. So even when Mao Zedong uh, attacked Confucius and Confucian thinking, which he did, this didn't really, I think, take hold because of the historic influence and power of the thought. You might think here to a much lesser extent, but nonetheless, of the, Brit of the British civil service in its heyday, let's say from the last half or last third of the 19th century until the Cold War, when everyone, pretty much, who went to the schools from which senior people were drawn knew the Greek and Latin classics. And some knew them very well. Or you might consider the upper crust of the French civil service, where they all study, and they still study, Descartes, and the Enlightenment, and so on. And the upper crusts of these civil services are extremely important in running the country. Confucius expresses the point of this kind of education, 
rather than a merely technical education, uh, in one of his remarks, let me read it. The master said, wouldn't it be wonderful to have before anything you said, the master said, uh, the master said, a gentleman does not behave as a tool. The education is not merely an education to be an implement or a tool for someone else, but it's to be the kind of education to lead and govern. So, I mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, the likeness that people sometimes see to Aristotle and why Plato and Aristotle are a good jumping off point for understanding Confucius. And I'll begin my discussion of the substance of the Analects by saying what, compared to Aristotle, it is not. What's the difference? Uh, and I think that'll help us to place the Analects intellectually or philosophically in relation to something more familiar. Compared to Aristotle, there's no development of practical reason. There's no development of the elements of practical reasoning. Nor is there a defense of intellectual reason, or what Aristotle calls intellectual virtue, as such. There's no defense of unbridled philosophical inquiry of the sort one sees in Book 10 of Aristotle's Ethics, or in Plato, and in the Republic in particular. Compared to Aristotle, there's also no systematic discussion of the elements of justice or the elements of happiness or of the virtues or even friendship. There's lots of discussion of some of those things, but no systematic discussion. By that I mean not only that matters aren't traced to some ontological or metaphysical foundation. They're not, but they're not really in Aristotle either in the ethics. I mean that, but I also mean that the varieties and alternatives of virtue, justice, happiness are not systematically traced and categorized as Aristotle does. Compared to Aristotle, there's also no discussion really of the human soul and the powers and abilities of the human soul. Even Aristotle's elementary discussion in the ethics, let alone Plato's discussion of the powers of the soul in the Republic, or both of their more fundamental discussions in other works. Compared to John Locke, in a way, the, one of the great intellectual founders behind the Declaration of Independence, compared to John Locke, there are in Confucius no individual rights no individual natural rights, no tracing of political authority to natural individual authority, no opening up of property to full private acquisition, and no true consent of the governed. There's little valuing of competition. The master said, there's nothing which gentlemen compete over. If competition were inevitable, it would be an archery, wouldn't it? But they go up bowing and making way for each other, and when they come down, they have a drink. So even in their competition with each other, they are gentlemen. No real competition argued for as a good thing uh, in a manner similar to ours. In terms of what Confucius does emphasize in these books, but is not discussed in Aristotle, one obvious difference is Confucius's emphasis on ritual, on custom, on forms of dress, on manners, one might say. There's nothing at all in the ethics of Aristotle or in his other works that's really like book 10 of the Analects of Confucius, which is where a lot of this discussion of ritual occurs. So because of all of these facts, um, the discussions in Confucius or the sayings in Confucius often seem more like exhorting 
hortatory statements of the, fine, of the sort that you might occasionally even find in, in elements of Plato's dialogues before then Plato and Socrates dig into the real meaning and intellectual substance of those issues. The Analects are really about how to follow a way, how to follow a traditional way in terms of what he thinks is best in that way and given whatever choices are still open to it. All of that said, lots of what he recommends that you do are, I think, what we would also recommend. To fully explore the substance of the Analects would require a lengthy study, but I can at least indicate, I think, the major terms, the major guidelines of Confucius's thought. I put it this way in terms of guidelines, because the Analects, as I just indicated, are about how to behave, but in particular, they're about how to behave generally if you have or aspire to a particular role or a particular station. They're not based on universal individualism where everything is in principle open to everyone. They're not really based on the kind of behavior which is in principle open to everyone, but they're very much tied to particular roles, particular status. In addition to considering the Analects by thinking about its major guidelines, one should also see that Confucius's remarks are often directed to particular disciples. They're a group of disciples with whom he has these discussions in the Analects, and they're different. They have particular qualities, particular limits that are mentioned in the Analects itself. So it's not always clear if a given remark is meant to be generally applicable, as it might seem, or more particularly applicable to whoever, the one to whom it's being addressed. So given all this, what are the major terms or major thoughts? There's first the key human type, the key or central human type that he recommends. The gentleman as opposed to the petty or small man. That's the difference. To read a couple of things. Ji Kang Zi asked Master Kong about government, saying, suppose I were to kill those who lack the way in order to advance those who have the way, how would that be? Master Kong replied, you are running the government, so what is the point of killing? If you desire good, the people will be good. The nature of the gentleman is as the wind, and the nature of the small man is as the grass. When the wind blows over the grass, it always bends. So the, this is among, of course, his famous sayings on which you could reflect <laughs> for a long time. To read something else about, about gentlemen, which he says. The master said, the gentleman reaches out for what is above. The small man reaches out for what is below. You'd rather be a gentleman, of course. <laughs> there are also people he calls men of quality, those who have particular virtues, particular skills, those he calls sages who have a, a, a certain level of learning even beyond the gentleman. There's further what he once calls the complete man. All of these are high or desirable types, and it's the gentleman who's most fully described. He also discusses the people who are governed, various levels of government officials. There's very little on women, by the way, and the major statement about women uh, would be politically incorrect for us now. 
I, there, I therefore won't read it to you. <laughs> um, now, uh, gentlemen are supposed to embody or uh, exemplify a characteristic which you can translate, it's called ren, R-E-N, when it's transliterated and so on. That's the central quality. It's often translated as humaneness or humanity, sometimes translated as generosity. Benevolence might be better, or perhaps kind of graciousness, propriety, refinement. You might say it's the gracious ease or propriety that in the past used to define the gentleman, not just his past, but our past as well. You might call this graciousness or humaneness uh, the broad substance of virtuous action in regard to others. One reason that graciousness or benevolence, in a way, is a useful translation, maybe more than humaneness simply, is because this quality is not something I think characteristic of all human beings, as Confucius sees it. Again, it's most likely the graceful ease and propriety of the gentleman in particular. To be humane, I'll use that term, is not to be rude or coarse or devious. The master said, when substance prevails over refinement, there's churlishness. And when refinement or mere refinement prevails over substance, there is pedantry. Only if refinement and substance are properly blended does one become a gentleman. Now, next point, really. The virtues or humaneness or benevolence generally are displayed primarily in various relationships with parents, therefore familial piety or familial duty, which is another central practice, of course, in Confucius, and loyalty generally. Master Yu said, Master Yu is one of the disciples, few indeed are those who are naturally filial towards their parents and dutiful towards their elder brothers, but are also fond of opposing their superiors. And it never happens, it never happens that those who do not like opposing their superiors are fond of creating civil disorder. It's the kind of so-called conservatism of Confucius. The gentleman concerns himself with the root. And if the root is firmly planted, the way grows. Filial piety and fraternal duty, surely they are the roots of humaneness. The master said, young men should be filial when at home and respectful to elders went away from home. They should be earnest and trustworthy. Although they should love the multitude far and wide, they should be intimate only with the humane. I'll read one other. The Duke of Xi told Master Kong, in my locality, there's a certain paragon, for when his father stole a sheep, he, the son, bore witness against him. Master Kong said, in my locality, those who are upright are different from this. Fathers cover up for their sons, and sons cover up for their fathers. Uprightness is to be found in this. Yeah, and that can be compared with a well-known dialogue uh, on piety uh, of Plato's called the Euthyphro, which, uh, whose action concerns this kind of thing. 
It's not clear, I think, from all this that piety towards one's father is meant to be as complete morally or as oppressive as it seems to have become in some later periods in China. In loyalty, one also displays other characteristics, friendliness, honesty, or trustworthiness. Again, gentlemanly or virtuous actions are displayed and are connected to these people and functions. They're not merely for Confucius, a general set of qualities that follow some sort of universal law. As I said, Confucius does not trace the virtues and the qualities to their intellectual roots. They're recommended and to a, dis uh, to a, to a degree they're described, but they're not really defended philosophically. Now, as I've said and have just been saying, uh, the favored human types, let's say the gentlemen, the ones to which one aspires, even if you can't quite reach it, the gentleman and the sage, all of these practice virtuous actions not abstractly or as objects of universal rules, but rather they practice them always within a context. And the context, and this is really the next point, the context is primarily or directly within ritual behavior or customary ritual. Li, L-I, is the term that's usually translated in one of those ways. That's also connected to reverence and courteous behavior. But it's not, at least it seems not to be in Confucius, religious worship of gods or direct concern with an afterlife. Where Confucius is on that issue is a deep question uh, for those who study him. Ritual behavior also reflects and involves refined and cultured behavior. So to sum this up, the central element of Confucius's teaching, what is central is graciousness or propriety in customary practices and customary relations. That really is the is, is kind of the central substantive element of Confucius's set of teachings. To read again some of that, Zhang Gong asked about humaneness. The master said, when you are away from home, behave as if receiving an important guest. Employ the people as if you were officiating at a great sacrifice. Do not impose on others what you would not like yourself then there will be no resentment against you, either in the state or in the family. Zhang Gong said, although I'm not clever, I beg to put this advice into practice. Fan Chi, another disciple, asked about humaneness. The master said, courtesy in private life, reverence in handling business, Loyalty in relations with others, this should not be set aside even if one visits the barbarian tribes. Mm -hmm. And a final one in this group. Master Kong said, there are nine things the gentleman concentrates on. In seeing, he concentrates on clarity, in listening, he concentrates on acuteness. In expression, he concentrates on warmness. In demeanor, he concentrates on courtesy. In words, he concentrates on loyalty. In deeds, he concentrates on reverence. When he's in doubt, he concentrates on asking questions. When he's indignant, he concentrates on the problems, kind of the obstacles which would slow you down, slow down your indignity. And when he sees opportunity for gain, he concentrates on what is right. <laughs> A hard group of things, I think, to actually do so completely. Now, the next point. All of this, again, let's call it gentlemanliness and humaneness, all of this comes together only with learning, moral and cultural 
as well as, to a degree, military and mathematical learning. The master said, you have heard the six sayings about the six hidden, hidden consequences? When he replied that he had not, the master went on, sit down and I will tell you. If one loves humaneness but does not love learning, the consequence of this is folly. If one loves understanding but does not love learning, the consequence of this is unorthodoxy. If one loves good faith but does not love learning, the consequence of this is damaging behavior. If one loves straightforwardness but does not love learning, the consequence of this is rudeness. If one loves courage but does not love learning, the consequence of this is rebelliousness. If one loves strength but does not love learning, the consequence of this is violence. So people can, of course, deviate from propriety. They probably usually do, in fact. And Confucius's interest, his concern, is to restore us to what he thinks is the proper way. This proper way, he also indicates, actually occurred earlier in the reign of uh, the, the uh, Duke Zhou. The perfect or best time, as Confucius sees it, is actually thought of as something which once concretely existed. He doesn't project a kind of impossible best government. Rather, the best government is something he claims actually to have existed in the past. In fact, Confucius thinks of himself as a transmitter, not as a creator. The master said, I transmit, but do not create. Being fond of the truth, I am an admirer of antiquity. The master said, if by keeping the old warm, one can provide understanding of the new, one is fit to be a teacher. It's a nice, <laughs> nice thought, as so many of these are. So one can see in all of this that he exhorts us to a way of life that consists of proper behavior in different activities or functions or actions, proper ways, that emphasize ritual and family or filial piety, not radical individualism, and that points to virtuous action a little bit less as character simply and more in terms of, again, gentlemanly propriety and refinement, even a kind of mannered formalism in activity. That's important for the following reason for him. You might wish to act correctly, but what actually is correct behavior also depends on how others understand what you're doing and how you see them. And that's one reason why observing custom and ritual can be important for displaying proper respect. This is from book eight, uh, chapter two. The master said, if one is courteous but does without ritual, then one dissipates one's energy. If one is cautious but does without ritual, then one becomes timid. If one is bold but does without ritual, then one becomes reckless. If one is forthright but does without ritual, then one becomes rude. Hence the need for ritual to actually bring about proper action, whatever one's intention. Because government, politics, government is such an interest of ours, let me discuss Confucius's views on this further. Confucius's sayings on this are largely about officials in government and their behavior, how they should act, what their relations are. Central is trust and the similarity between action in the family and activity in government. His remarks are not really very much about institutions or even about justice directly. 
but primarily about behavior and action. Let me read a few things to give you a sense of what his views on this are. Duke Ding asked how rulers should employ ministers and how ministers should serve rulers. Master Kong replied, rulers in employing ministers do so in accordance with ritual, and ministers in serving rulers do so in accordance with loyalty. Zizong asked about government. The master said, if there's enough food, and if there are enough weapons, the people will put their trust in it. Zizong said, suppose you definitely had no alternative but to give up one of these three, food, weapons, trust, which would you relinquish first? The master said, I would give up weapons. Zizong said, suppose you definitely had no alternative but to give up one of the remaining two, which would you relinquish first? The master said, I would give up food. From of old, death comes to all men, but a people will not stand if it lacks trust. And then I'll read um, a couple more on government. Zhang Gong, being steward to the Ji family, asked about government. The master said, give a lead to your officials, pardon minor errors, and promote men of quality and talent. He said, how does one recognize men of quality and talent <laughs> so as to promote them? He said, the master said, promote those you do recognize, for will others neglect those you do not recognize? and decide how helpful that answer is. <laughs> uh, and one more. <coughs> Zhi Kang Zi asked how the people might be induced to be respectful and loyal so they might be properly encouraged. The master said, if you oversee them with dignity, they will be respectful if you're dutiful towards your parents and kind to your children, then they will be loyal. If you promote the good and instruct the incompetent, then they will be encouraged. Let me now say something very briefly about the, the following question. Um, what, given all this, could one say about about Confucius and contemporary Chinese politics and government. During Mao's reign, as I said, Confucius was condemned as reactionary. But now the rulers celebrate him. As I said, they call their institutes Confucian Institutes. The question is whether or not Confucius' writings are a force for individual freedom, rights, privacy, and independence. He's certainly a force for virtue, humaneness, learning, trust, and friendship. And in that sense, just as Aristotle would be, against tyranny. Confucius favors a kind of gentlemanliness. Confucius also distinguishes governments that follow the right way from those that do not follow the right way. Confucius also argues in favor of the importance of the proper alignment of names and things, the so-called rectification of names, of calling political and social things what they actually are. One might say he opposes in advance some of our political correctness. Moreover, although humaneness is practiced socially, it's also ultimately in one's own power to try to seek it. But as I said, we do not see in Confucius the openness of individual desire and satisfaction. And there's a limit which comes from the great importance he places on the kind of given political and social roles. So I would say, but anyone could disagree, 
that Confucius, the actual Confucius of the Analects, is on the whole a healthy or salutary force for good politics, but not simply. Healthy because you could not honestly say that the current leaders are expressing proper Confucian qualities. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll say a couple more things and then we can, uh, then we can, have, we can have some questions. Confucius took um, many characteristics seriously and he wanted them for himself and in many ways, these self-understandings uh, are seen as exemplary for other people as well. The master said, the failure to cultivate virtue, the failure to put it into practice, the failure to put into practice what I've learned, hearing what is right and being unable to move towards it, being unable to change what's not good, these are my worries. The master said, in making an effort, I am comparable with others. But as to myself being a gentleman in practice, I have never yet managed to achieve that. <laughs> the master said, at 15, I set my heart on learning. At 30, I was established. At 40, I had no perplexities. At 50, I understood the decrees of heaven. At 60, my ear was in accord, and at 70, I followed what my heart desired, but did not transgress what was right. The master said, do I, for my part, really possess understanding? No, I do not possess understanding. But if there is an ordinary person putting a question to me, although his mind seems to be quite blank, I hammer at both sides of the question and go into it thoroughly. Confucius also took music and poetry very seriously and the beauty connected to them and the proper behavior that's sometimes connected to them. In this, he's like Plato, but he doesn't think through or attempt even to think through universal characteristics by which one could specify beauty. I'll conclude uh, with his humor or even his sarcasm and uh, a couple of my favorite sayings in addition to the ones I've read. Ji Wenzi thought, thought three times before acting. When the master heard of this, he said, twice will be enough. <laughs> um, and a couple of others. The master said, if a man does not anticipate deception and does not reckon on bad faith, but on the other hand, is aware in good time when they occur, he is a man of quality, isn't he? And then finally, 217, the master said, you, this is one of the disciples whose nickname is you, you, shall I teach you about understanding something? When you understand something, to recognize that you understand it. But when you do not understand something, to recognize that you do not understand it. That is understanding. And then, actually, this is the final one now, so I can't, I, can't, I can't resist this, especially in this context. The master said, it is not easy to find anyone who studies for three years, but is not intent on a salary. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Confucius in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blitz. We now have time for a few questions. Please make your way to the microphone if you have a question. Uh, 
Aristotle was the one that discovered man's mind and reason and understanding the world that way. Aren't you giving Confucius too much credit by comparing him to Aristotle? Because Aristotle is unique in the known history of the world. I try to, I try to lay out some of the differences between Aristotle and Confucius. Um, the grounds of comparison uh, come from you know, the relative similarity in time, Confucius is older, and the listing of the virtues and the listing of the human qualities and the thinking through of those qualities, that's really the, the substance of the comparison. But in a way, it's precisely the philosophical underpinnings that you don't see in Confucius and the full working out of the various dimensions and possibilities of the virtues, happiness, and so on. So, um, I think I'm giving Aristotle his proper rank. <laughs> You'd mentioned... Uh, over here, over here. Okay. I see. <laughs> Exit stage right or something. Um, you had mentioned um, that during Mao's time, he tried to eliminate references to Confucius. And of course, there was the famous Little Red Book of Mao during the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> In your knowledge of, uh, of Confucius, do you know whether any of his particular sayings were plagiarized by Mao? No, I don't know concretely, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, Mao also, um, in the uh, condemnation of Confucius, had everyone read Confucius to see all the things that were wrong which was maybe not so wise. Um, and, and, and the new group, the new group is wiser about those matters, I would say. But I would really have to look carefully at the Little Red Book and, and other works of Mao to, to answer that question concretely. So uh, speaking of the new regime and how they've more or less capitulated to the cultural history of Confucianism, um, do you have any insights on how they've managed to sort of round the square peg there around stuff like, for example, calling it like it is, uh, stuff like that. It's not very common with Soviet-style totalitarian communist regimes. I, you know, there is this element in, in Confucius where uh, you, you act as you should in relation to the role that you have. Uh, Confucius is not revolutionary. He's not radical, really, in, in his thinking in even the way that, uh, let's say, Plato is. Um, so I think you can work with <laughs> elements in Confucius uh, in a useful way. But in the long run, if people take Confucius seriously, they will see the difference between the government they have and the virtues that are being suggested by Confucius. So there, there's a lot of material that you can work with in sort of incorporating Confucius um, into your your arguments and your propaganda. Now I've got it. Hi, thank you for your, spe your speech today. Um, <clears throat> would you say that the current regime has tried to capture Confucianism the way that the left here in America is, is captured as liberal? Um, I even hear con conservatives speak about the left as if they deserve the title liberal, and I'm wondering if you could make that comparison. I mean, for a while, the general kind of category for our regime is indeed liberal democracy, so it's not, it's, it's not accurate, right, as you're suggesting, for liberalism in the true sense to be, be captured by the left, and even the left of this kind of left-right divide, which kind of became formal in a, in a way in the, in the 1820s or 1830s, um, the liberal element there was a pro-business and pro-parliament element. So yeah, uh, there is something wrong about the way in which we talk about our politics, for sure. Um, Yes, I think the goal of, of, of the current regime, and I think that's true of, in a way, any thoughtful regime, is to try to have behind you as much as you can that you think the people won't give up. So radical as you might be, uh, it may often be the case 
that you want to show elements of what you're doing as, a, as, a, as, as continuous with what's been there in the past. How successful they'll be, I don't know. I mean, that's, that would be a prediction that it would be, that it would be hard to make. Um, so we'll see. You mentioned weapons, so I know Confucius thought about it. Could you share some sayings on his ideas about war and conflict? So archery, archery is the, one of the things that you're supposed to study. Uh, Confucius was not ultimately that interested in war. Um, he's not really, I think, where you'd look for strategy, as there are, of course, other great works that, that you'd look at. It's secondary always uh, uh, to virtue, you might say. Um, Confucius is not against punishment, but punishment is secondary to virtue also. It shouldn't be necessary. So Confucius is more in that direction and not so much in the direction of war and, and conflict. Harmony would come closer to what he might desire than conflict would. No, he's certainly not a pacifist, and he himself in, engaged in certain kind of political activities. He's not a pacifist, but war is not his favorite option. War, there are a lot of wars then, though, and you needed, you needed to fight in order to preserve, to preserve yourself and to preserve your dynasty. So pacifism, no. But war as something uh, desirable, uh, not much. Courage is one of the virtues, but it's not one that goes all that far by itself either, but certainly not pacifism. Probably like many of us here in the room, I graduated from college in 69, and Chairman Mao's little red book was kind of everywhere, even though I was on a relatively safe campus, so to speak. And I wasn't reminded of that until one of Obama's initial appointees declared that Mao and Mother Teresa were her favorite philosophers. <laughs> and I'm, is there anyone outside of people in Berkeley and Harvard who think of Mao as a philosopher? Is he venerated in his country or are they trying to discredit him? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave Mother Teresa <laughs> out of it. Um, um, yeah, I would, you know, I would say a lot of this um, um, has to do with uh, the relative power of China and the resurgence of, of, of that kind of activity and that kind of politics. Um, there are fewer direct Maoists than there were in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, but there's a, still, I think, a serious strain among certain people uh, of a kind of, a kind of Maoism. Um, <clears throat> but how far something like that will go <clears throat> depends very much on what happens, I think, in China itself. Uh, I don't come across uh, uh, even the colleagues of whom I'm not that fond. Um, <laughs> Uh, dancing up and down to tell me how wonderful Mao is. But of course, I would not be the one in front of whom they perform such a dance. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for coming to Hillsdale this evening for your discussion. In Stephen Mosher's book, The Bully of Asia, he draws attention to a comment from Confucius that reads, just as there are not two suns in the sky, so there cannot be two emperors on earth. And he ties it into ancient Chinese history. My question for you is from, as you understand him, does Confucian teaching endorse the ambitions of conquest by brute force as done from the great unification to the disputes with the West today? Well. Well, uh, Stephen Mosher will speak to you, so we, we, you, you can see what he says. I would say no, he doesn't endorse conquest by brute force because his goals uh, are not really served by brute force, but his, his picture of the best government was what you can consider a whole empire over the territory that he knew best. Didn't really function that way when he was alive. Um, and who knows whether it ever really functioned that way, but that was the government 
that he liked best. So that there might be a, a, a single empire over the known territory could well be. Um, if that needed to be brought about by force, one way or the other, perhaps. But not something I think that he would want to be kept in place by force, kept in place by fear, but rather by these other qualities he's discussing. Confucius would have been approximately a contemporary of the prophet Daniel from the Old Testament, and Daniel would have had known the history of the Hebrews, of course, and he studied the Chaldeans. I just wonder whether you are aware of any connection educationally, whether Confucius could have gotten his ideas about virtue and, and the, you know, the principal underpinnings of him seem to have a lot of parallels with biblical history, and I just wonder if you could address that. Well, I'm not, I'm not aware of any direct connection, and it would be difficult because of the kind of isolation of these places from each other. I mean, there are various arguments uh, to the effect that, and which find it very interesting, that you have so many movements uh, in religion and, and even philosophy more or less around the same time make, making somewhat similar statements. Um, but I doubt that there would be any direct connection, um, but you know, one, one can never say never. But I don't, none that I'm aware of and, 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 and I would doubt is given the, the range of things that Confucius knew of or didn't know of, given he traveled, uh, but the travel is obviously limited. So you would have to find something that somehow came <laughs> and that he, that he saw. Uh, and I think that's not all that likely. A lot of his thought, of course, resonates with things in the past, but some of it is novel as well. So that would be my view, but those things are always subject to, uh, to new, new discovery. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Blitz. Thank you.